Hello and thank you for tuning in. Today we are discussing psychological safety. What is it? How do you put it into place? And what effect can it have in the workplace? And I'm delighted to be joined by two leaders in the field to discuss this. Gina Batty is a world-renowned, award-winning psychological safety consultant and trainer. Hi, Gina, who's created The Five Pillars, which is a diagnostic tool for employers to use and who is campaigning to make psychological safety part of UK workplace legislation. And Shopi Agbalusi is an international speaker, executive coach and founder of My Mindset Shift, hi Shopee, uh, who helps leaders to think differently and focus on people over profit. Uh, please do feel free as always to get involved with our conversation, share your own experiences and ask questions to our panel as we go. Uh, just put your, uh, your um, uh, questions into the comments and we'll take those through the conversation. Um, so Gina uh, and Shopee, First of all, perhaps we could start rather than with the term psychological safety, just with why you both have decided that this was something that you felt was really important in the workplace and your own experiences in taking this up as a theme. Uh, Gina, perhaps you could kind of kick us off. Mm, yeah, sure. Of course. Um, my journey began right in my early career, actually. I had two experiences that led me to do the work that I do now. The first was I was 22 years old four foot 11 inches tall sadly i haven't grown very much i wish i had um and i was teaching ex-offenders adult ex-offenders um long story short i was stalked by a very dangerous man so that's the first the second is i decided to leave that job behind that was my first job left it behind and became a teacher in a further education college and i was bullied for being gay by my manager actually and when i reported it it was really strange because I thought things would resolve and it just didn't. My manager was actually promoted, believe it or not. And I was told not to progress the case any further because it would highlight my sexual orientation to my colleagues. Really didn't want that to happen. So I decided to leave. I uh, set up my own business, started off talking around LGBT plus inclusion in the very early days that very quickly um, evolved and escalated into talking about the much bigger picture. So how do we create psychologically safe workplaces for everybody? How can we make sure that people can show up at work, feel safe and be able to thrive in the workplace? So yeah, very long story short, there you go. <laughs> that was a very, very good summary. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, some difficult experiences that you've had there in the workplace that have factored into the thinking of where you've taken uh, your, your thinking since then. So Shopee, what, what's your experience of, uh, of this, this term psychological safety and why do, you, why do you incorporate that now into the executive coaching that you do and the leadership coaching? I think very much like Gina as well. I also started off in, in the workplace. Um, I think I was also around 22 actually. Um, <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember one of the um was like one of the first like proper roles I had straight after university and I was in an environment that just was very toxic. I had a leader who did not have any psychological safety whatsoever. I reported that particular leader to HR and I was told, yep, we're aware of this. We've been aware of this for a very long time. However, we're not gonna get rid of him because he's very valuable at what he does. And that was a surprise. And then I kind of launched my own mini investigation and I started to find out that actually there are a lot of other people in that particular area who had complained about him and about his behavior, but they'd just been completely shut down. So that was like my first problem. I was like, there is no safety here. I couldn't really talk. I couldn't really share. I couldn't really bring ideas. Every day I literally came into that building, that space, for us to say like, wake up in the morning, get into work, I drive into that particular um, work environment. I had a migraine. And every time I left that five, the migraine left. That's how bad it kind of was for me in that period of time. And then like fast forward a number of years later, I go into my own leadership like positions running different teams. And I had a team which I was like, the youngest person in that team I was given was like 15 years um, older than me. So I had to learn how to use psychological safety to actually try to breach a lot of different um, barriers that we kind of had. And I saw the impact that kind of had. And all the way throughout my career, I've seen it play out in different ways. I've been in CEO um, boardrooms as a, when I worked in corporate and have conversations where 
everyone kind of like agrees with the CEO and then they walk out and start having a different conversation. Like, didn't we just talk about this? And we all agree is that, yeah, but we couldn't say what we wanted to say. So I've seen all that play out and the impact has had on people, the work, the productivity. And that's why I kind of like, when I moved to the other side of things, I'm like, I want to change all that because I've seen the positive impact, I've seen the negative impact, and I want to know the positive and less the negative. So let's look at, at the phrase itself then, because um, as far as our, my my very you know uh, brief reading around the subject has has happened, it, it's a term that's been around since the 1950s, I think, Gina. But it was sort of been it's sort of come back to life in, in the last sort of 20 odd years through Amy Edmondson, who's the I, I think the professor of leadership and management at Harvard Business School, did some research in healthcare settings, I believe, and just suddenly realised that. Uh, you know, actually teams that were making maybe more mistakes and being a bit more critical of what they were doing actually were better performers than those who kept everything under wraps. And I guess from what, what you and Shoppy have just said there, you know, it's it comes from kind of looking at a negative, but actually turning that into a positive. I, I don't know, maybe you could explain a bit better. Yeah, sure, sure. You, you're right. It has been around for, for a long time. Um, Rose to fame, I guess, fame, I use that term loosely, <laughs> um, with Amy Edmonton's work. Um, I'm also familiar with William Kahn's work. Uh, he did some work in the 1990s. He's a professor, that, professor of organisational behaviour at Boston University. Um, and he coined that term engagement. Um, He's got quite a similar definition, I guess, really, to Amy. So um, it was quite fascinating when I was doing my own research in terms of kind of how it's evolved over the years. But yeah, the definitions are quite similar. Um, as you said, it, it rose um, in the business world, I think, specifically because of this whole idea of um, people not feeling safe to speak up. But I think that psychological safety is a much, much bigger picture than that, to be honest. Um, when I talk to organisations, a lot of organisations talk about this idea of not being able to speak up and taking risks. But I think from my personal experience as a gay woman in the workplace, but also socially in relationships in life, it is a much bigger picture than that. And I've got a very different uh, definition to it, I guess, really. Um, it's much wider. Obviously, it does encompass the idea of um, feeling safe to take risks and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's got a lot of traction recently as well. I don't know if you agree, Shoppy. Have you noticed the the traction probably within the last maybe five years? I would say. Yeah, it's um it's kind of gone up and down because I remember when um, Amy Everson came out and her thing kind of brought her back into the limelight, and then they had Project Aristotle with Google that really really blew up, and then it went quiet for a while, and then completely yeah. the last couple of years it's kind of come back. It's then come back up again and it's been really talked about more and more and more. And I actually like the original definition from um, Carl Rogers. And yes, he talked about being able to take that interpersonal risk. But as the element a says around without fear of negative consequences to self-esteem or status. And that's the bit that I don't think is talked about enough. To your point around... Actually, there is a fear that happens in the environment, but the fear or the consequences that happens to the self. And that bit is where I really, really like to hold in on. Because I'm like, there's not, it's a two-way, it's a two-way kind of thing. I, if I mm. say this, what's the risk to me? What am I potentially going to either give up, lose, or bring on myself in the name of the kind of way, as well as what's currently happening in the environment and that status? And I always was work we do, I always look at it from both the so I'm always navigating between the personal and the professional, kind of bring all that together. And a lot of like the training, I was the training I had, apart from learning theory and stuff like that, kind of came from the house. Like being married and stuff like that, I was like, actually, what's the cycle of your safety that's going to happen if I speak to this situation with, with my wife and what she's going to say and vice versa? And learning to be able to navigate that has kind of helped me to be able to really understand what that is when we talk about self esteem, because that's mm. what kind of stuff really happening. So do we think businesses really understand this at the moment or, or is it another one of those phrases that everybody's just seized or seized upon? I'd love to hear your thoughts first, Shoffy. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that you're giggling away. <laughs> I, I think they, they understand it at a very, very higher level. 
people to delve into it at a very much deeper level. And the reason why I say that is, in fact, one uh, example I use is when people think about psychological safety, they think about it as like, oh, it only happens in very like, small environments. I'm like, actually, you know what? Psychological safety happens in all of our lives. We just don't see it. A good example is um, Chernobyl disaster, which obviously we know absolutely um, disastrous consequences that happened out there. But actually, one of the things that came out in the report was there was a lack of psychological safety because the people were under pressure to meet their quotas, but they couldn't speak up. There was a risk that they felt their safety was at play if they spoke up, and that's one consequence. Another one that's very recent to us is the, um, the Grenfell disaster in the towers. Mm -hmm. Again, read the report, it's been talked about right there where people talked about how they, they felt like they couldn't, they couldn't speak up about it. Like they knew that things were wrong, they knew that it wasn't safe, but again, there was lack. So I was trying to bring that, you know what, if you start to look at it from those are real world examples that showing the impact on people's lives mm -hmm. now scale back and look at it from your organization what's the real effect it's having on people what's the thing what it's around i don't know turnover productivity um stress all the different factors there's no, no the reason why i say it doesn't they haven't got down deep is there's a disparity of like oh people are off for mental health reasons people are low productivity because of xyz they don't ever link and be like is it because we have a lack of psychological safety in our environment is why all these different factors are happening? Because there are a lot of times is, yeah. Yes. So that's that, why I still think it's a bit of understanding and going in deep with it and having a very high level bunch. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what, what, what is the impact? Um, Gina, perhaps we could pick that up, up, up with you. Is, you know, is there a, is there a positive business at, uh, impact that, you know, people have actually seen in the workplace for this change in behaviour? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think th there's two ways that we can look at this, right? We could look at it as the benefits or we could look at it on the impact of the organisation and the individual. And when I deliver my training, I often like actually to look at the negative aspects because it's so much more, um, you can see it a lot easier than seeing the positive benefits. So if I said positive benefits, we've got things like, you know, you've got improved employee well-being, employee engagement, but they're quite big terms. You know, they're quite um, big concepts as well. And you can't really measure that in, a, in an accurate way. But when I say, OK, the impact on the organisation is that your turnover, your revenue and your profit are negatively impacted. People can see that. They can measure that quite quickly and easily. OK, you'll also notice things like an increase in attrition, your HR team. You'll see a worrying level of retention amongst all the newest recruits. Uh, with the employees that remain, you're going to get low engagement and an increase in absenteeism. They're the things that you can kind of really easily measure. Um, there's loads of other stuff like loss in productivity, missed opportunities for innovation, ineffective collaboration between individuals and teams as well. You often get a, a lot of teams working in silos. Um, you'll also get a greater risk of accidents, incidents and injuries. Again, all things that you can measure. Problems are left unreported, corners are cut, R any wrongdoing or unethical or illegal behaviour, it does happen, remains unchallenged, you know, and this is where all those tragic failures can start to occur, which in some industries can be catastrophic. But, you know, the, the flip side to this is all of this is avoidable if individuals feel that they're able to bring their whole self to work. OK, so when I talk about psychological safety, it's a much bigger picture than, you know, can I feel safe to take risks? Um, my definition is, is fivefold. So there's five different aspects to it. One of them is about bringing your authentic self to work. The second is about communicating with crystal clear clarity all of the time. The third is about creating an, a work environment that's intentionally designed to facilitate exceptional collaboration and teamwork. The fourth is giving opportunities for reflection. And then the fifth is giving opportunities for creative exploration in teams. All of that to me is psychological safety and how you create and nurture psychological safety. So you can see that it's a much bigger picture than, you know, do I feel safe to speak up in this certain situation? Do I feel safe to take risks in, in other situations? So yeah, there's a big impact on the organization. There's a big impact on individuals as well. Don't know if you want maybe Shoppy to come in and talk about a few of those. Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, Shopee, the, you know, what Gina was saying there is that there's a difference there, isn't there, between the individual and the team 
maybe the manager and the team. You've got so many different personalities and individuals in, in a company. How, how on earth do you make this all work with, you know, people like you and me in the business? You know? <laughs> Shoppy, the short answer to a very good <laughs> You've got one minute. <laughs> well, I think you, you're kind of speaking to um, a point I was trying to make is people are complex, not complicated. And when I, when I use that, I mean that a lot of times people think that in a complicated situation, it's like one plus one equals to two. It's very formulaic, it's very, very driven. It works. I can apply the same thing to all, all three of us and we'll get the same results. People are very complex. We all need very different things. And once organizations try to start to understand that a lot more, then it makes it like what is the original team organization need. And you have a way throughout, which can make a massive, massive difference to kind of what we are, what we're talking about right now. And some of those points that um, Gina just made, which are absolutely super, super important. I love that there's five different breakdowns. For me, it always goes back into actually who is, I'm not sure if I'll come into this in a minute, but, but who is that, I guess, that key factor who can really start to make and change and bring all of some of those different things to life? That for me is where that really starts. And whether we like it or not, it always starts at the top. Like if the if the right behavior yeah. is not being modeled right at the top, it's not going to make a difference whether you're doing it in, in different spaces and places. So that's what I'm like, you always go to that. Like, what is that leader, the C-suite, the rest of their management team, all they're going to do it down, actually showing to their people in the way that they communicate, in the way that they make decisions, in the way that they bring people in, in the way that they are measuring like all different points that kind of Gina mentioned. Are those things actually happening? Or are they just like, yeah, psychology stays important. We're going to come through, you're going to do a course. We're going to tick that box. I'm going to walk away and everyone's yeah. kind of happy. That's where there's a, there's a that's where you're not. Right? Except the not. If you do one of Gina's courses, you, you're with her for three years, folks. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's a really important point, isn't it? Because, uh, like you say, it's got to come from the top, but leaders don't want to seem vulnerable. So how, how do you reconcile that with the fact that you, you maybe have got to show some vulnerability and, and show people that maybe you've got this facing the same things as they're facing in the workplace. And also, how do you how do you how do you do this with, you know, maybe, um, you know, employees and, and staff who are they don't want to bring their whole self. They don't want to show people who they are at work. You know, it's not a given that everybody wants to do that. Mm. It's a really good point. I, I want to address that bit first, if I'm the whole idea of not wanting to bring your whole self to work, because when I deliver training, we come to the questions at the end, and that is always the first question I get asked. And I'm like, I'm ready for you. I know the answer to this one. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. Not everybody will want to bring their whole self to work for various reasons. Individuals might want to protect their personal life. They might want to keep certain things private from the colleagues. The key thing is here is to respect everybody's boundaries and to not pressure them to share more than they're actually comfortable with sharing. I guess there's kind of four key things that you need to remember here. The first is that everyone's perception of safety is unique. So what I think is safe to me might not be safe to you, Jane, might not be safe to you, Shopee, and the people listening in. We've all got a very different experience of safety. The second point is some people find it difficult to bring their whole self to work because it can make them feel vulnerable. You mentioned vulnerability, or it might make them feel unsafe. The third is that we've all got unique personalities, preferences, working styles, and experience in the workplace. Shopee and I explained uh, earlier how we got into the work that we're doing. You know, other people in the world have very similar experiences, and we've got to remember that. So not everyone's going to feel comfortable bringing every single aspect of who they are into the workplace. And the fourth key area really is about encouraging individuals to bring their whole self to work Yes, it's important, but it's equally important to respect their boundaries and not to pressure them to share more than they're actually comfortable to do so. So you've got to remember this whole idea that, yes, bringing your whole self into the workplace, it is challenging and it might not be the right choice for everyone. However, if you choose to do so, organisations that engage with us in the work that we do are committed to creating that safe space for you to do that. But ultimately, ultimately the decision is yours. OK, and we respect that decision. Got so Gina, that. I mean, sorry, Shopee, just, just, um, I'm just thinking, so where do you actually start? 
you know, we, we're talking about quite a big picture here. Mm. Practically, where do you start? That, that's a good question. And, and typically, the first contact actually doesn't come from a senior leader in an organisation. It tends to come from somebody in HR or somebody from an employee resource group that wants to do something for a certain point in the year. So like this month, it's coming up to Pride Month. Last month, we had mental health awareness. It's usually hinged off the back of that. That's kind of how they start the process. So once we have that conversation, we find out what's going on in the organization, then it's about finding out what the actual issues are. And typically you don't know what those issues are until you ask people. The hardest thing that most organizations find is measuring psychological safety. So I always say you need to start with having conversations. Okay, so in one to ones, in team meetings across the whole organizations, talk about what is psychological safety, raise people's awareness. Once you've done that, then you can introduce some training and upskill people, give them the tools and the strategies that they need to be able to um, be able to bring their whole self to work. And then the third thing is ask people. So really start to measure where you currently are. And when I say measure, often when I ask um, the people that engage with me in the first place, they say, we think we've got a problem. We're not entirely sure. We think it's in this particular area. And then they think that because they, they kind of tag on questions to things that they're already putting out there, surveys that they're already doing, but they don't specifically measure psychological safety on its own. So I would say if you're wanting to get started, yes, there's loads of tools out there that you can kind of get a quick idea of how psychologically safe your organization is. But if you're really committed, you really want to make a difference, you have to dig deeper and do a specialized uh, assessment on how psychologically safe your workplace is as assessed by your employees, not by the senior leadership team. Right. So start with the employees, essentially. Yeah. Would, you, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, 100 yeah, percent And um I would actually make a slight distinction to what Gina said around using your your managers to kind of have conversations around like the safety. The reason why I say that is there are certain environments where you don't feel safe with your manager. Mm-hmm. And therefore everyone's bringing it up, you're not going to tell them what's, what's really going on. You're going to kind of hide it because you don't feel safe to do so. So actually what I've um, led with actually to your point, um, Gina, around actually going in and finding out an organization, we're not sure if you have a problem or not. It's like doing focus groups, mm. having that space where you have someone who's completely external to do focus groups and, and lean into what's happening within the organization. That's been key. But I will add this, because this is where, again, I've seen it's gone wrong. You've done focus groups, you've got some data around it now, and now becomes, now go ahead and do it. It's like, no, you need to actually really be like, okay, we've, we're gonna take intentional action and we're gonna talk about it. That's the bit that I think always goes missing because nothing worse than spending your time to be like, I'm pouring out to this person, they've got the data and research, and then it comes back in and either nothing happens with it or it's thrust back to the employees they go and figure it out. Both of those two things will never work. So. Utilize the data, take authentic action, which is a good sign right from the start to organization that we are taking this seriously. That for me is a really, really key that really now has to help. Like the environment, the organization, the whole, everyone completely is like, we are serious about this. We are going to do something about this. We're going to take these action steps. And then these are what we're going to do, what it's going to look like going forward. That's where that key kind of lands for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how do, how do you engage this the the, the top of the of, of the organisation in that then Shopee? What well, what's the best way? So if a team, you know, an HR team or well being team have been looking at this and doing this sort of focus groups research, what what's the bit that connects it to then the leadership in the com- in the company? The bit that connects it is after they've done something like that and they've now got the data kind of presented one the leadership team need to talk about it and talk about it to the whole company and say that this is what we are doing and this is why we have done it. That's mm-hmm. that's number one, that's key. And then the second now bit now comes, they then talk about what steps that they're taking for themselves. And then we talked about um, earlier on around vulnerability and how leaders, some, some like it, some don't. And I would say, <laughs> if you're in that position, vulnerability is some of the things that you need to learn how to, to do and show and show in your own way. It's not something that you can hide or get away from. So leaders actually talking about, okay, these are steps that we might be the CEO, for example, me as an individual, here's what I'm going to do and change going forward because of X, Y, Z. It's important to hear. 
is what me and my team are going to do going forward. Again, it's important to hear because what you're now doing is creating a system that is very, very accountable publicly. When things are done in closed doors, you don't hear that. But if I'm hearing my CEO say this and I hear my SLT say this and they're saying it publicly to everyone else, I'm going to hold them accountable. And again, that now makes it start to embed in the, in the culture that this is very, very serious. So that's where that link kind of happened between the data and then CEO, the C-suite kind of talking about it. Mm. Gina, is that, that, that's the sort of method that you kind of use then, that sort of collection of data and then the filtering of the results of that right through the teams, right through the organisation, kind of filtering almost back up. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it, it's fascinating, really, when, when you start taking an organisation through this process. So, like I said, the, the typical kind of process is somebody comes in from HR or a wellbeing team or an employee resource group. They put on a, a training session for everybody in the organisation. They obviously invite all the senior leadership team they're encouraged to attend. Then once the senior leadership team are there, that's when their interest really starts to perk up because they can see the benefits, they can see the impact, you know, and they can they can really understand what it means in practical terms, day-to-day -day terms. So that usually is the first kind of port of call for most senior leaders that I work with. Then typically what happens is they, they kind of buy into it and they go, yeah, okay, this is something that we're really passionate about. We want to do something about this. So that, at that point, that's when the senior leadership team take over and they say, right, how are we going to do something here? How are we going to make the changes that we need to make? And how are we going to measure how psychologically safe everybody is feeling currently so we can actually put some interventions in place? So from that point onwards, as soon as we've engaged the senior leadership team kind of through the back door, if you like, they then start to um, get some training for themselves. So I believe that leaders and managers need additional kind of resources, strategies, tools to be able to navigate how to create a psychologically safe environment. OK, so typically what I would do after we've done the, the general training for everyone is, OK, so here's what you need now as leaders and managers. This is what you need to be able to do. Here are some of the key areas that you need to focus on. And then from that point, they, they say, OK, right, we feel good about this. Now we want to put out some sort of communication that this is you know, this is something we're committed to. We want to take some action here. So at that point, they typically would go, OK, we need to measure it. Let's let's have a look at looks, the diagnostic tool that I use. Let's look at looks. Let's have a look at how this might work. Let's roll it out across to everybody in the organisation. So they all take the survey. Once the details come back from that, we prepare a report from our end. We feed that back to the leaders and managers. We then encourage them to share that across the board. So no hiding anything, literally share this everywhere okay people need to know what other people are saying and it there's no judgment at all okay it's this is where we are right now you know putting a stake in the sand if you like this is where we are how can we make a difference what are the key areas we need to focus on and how are we going to do that moving forwards but without that data they can't do that they're kind of going along blindly trying to figure out the way forwards um so typically that's kind of the journey that we take people through Obviously, off the back of that, we can then offer different strategies, different methodologies, cycles, uh, all of that good stuff to help people to increase their psychological safety, but in targeted areas, not just by delivering training, like Shopee said earlier, that ticks a box and we're done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just pointless. Yeah. And, and Shopee, you know, there's you know we've we've got people on this call today who are running you know um hr teams uh well-being groups managers in in very different companies so you know you might be a high performing law firm where you know it's all about the billing billing per minute you know everything's got to be got 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 got, got to earn money for the business you've got maybe uh, you know multinational with people in all sorts of geographical locations you've got a lot of us like like we are doing today sitting at a computer remote working it's quite a difficult sort of thing to get your head around as to how you make this idea around psychological safety work for such different types of businesses and organizations Shoppy, sorry, I was uh, asking you. I didn't, I didn't finish that off with a question, did I? But, you know, is there a, you know, are there different different ways that you approach this for different types of organisations and different type of work setups? Yes, there is. 
um, especially I think the last two years or so when we've seen the the growth of um, hybrid working or remote and in terms of people showing up. I mean, back in the day when it's just like mainly in the office environment, there's certain things that you can do, which is very much specific focus to that. Now, when you have like it's very geographical in the locations, it's like recognizing what is important to them. It might be things around, I don't know, meeting etiquette, for example, which I might be like, we're on camera, what are things that work, but doesn't work, what makes me feel safe? That's been very, very important to be able to understand organizations. It's been even like in situations and spaces where some of us might be on camera, some of us have been in a, in a physical location, again, the hybrid working, how does that work to make sure that we're kind of including everyone and, and feeling their way through? So it's kind of different things like that, that you have to understand. That's why I, right at the start when we both said it, there's no one size fits all approach. It's tailoring what you are doing for your organization. When we've seen the one size fits all cookie cutter kind of approach is when things have not worked. And that's just a good example of a tick in the box exercise. Whereas when mm -hmm. I can bring it into your organization, your values, your people, make it real and relevant for you, that's when it lasts and that's when it sticks. And I will say that one thing that also makes a difference is to do that, it takes time. So patience is key. This is not like, yep, in the next three months, I want to have the best, <laughs> the best environment. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't get there overnight. So recognizing that it's being very, very patient. It's looking at different spaces and places within your organization. It's even recognized from Gina's point where it's like, you know what? We're not going to tackle all of it. We might focus on this particular area first because based on what we're seeing and hearing, this is the most critical. And then that can then start to, that's really, really important to be able to do. So whether it's a law firm, an automotive firm, medical, like being like we want a bespoke target approach to our values again. And that kind of brings the whole business um, side of things aligned with the objective you're trying to fulfill. Because if you're doing something that's just very abstract, it doesn't work for you. So that for me is very, very key. And I'll just also add on one thing I um, just kind of came to mind as well. One of the data sets that people tend to ignore is when you have exit interviews and high attrition numbers, there's a lot of information that's being shared in there that is actually linked to psychological safety. Mm -hmm. But a lot of time until someone else looks into it, it's not labeled as such. So even looking at that is something that people can start to do from now. Be like, why are people leaving? What's been mentioned? And what can we actually understand? Be like, oh, that's because there is a lack of psychological safety within our culture. That's why. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That sort of disillusionment with the workplace uh, mm -hmm. is a key factor there. So, Gina, could we uh, perhaps we could start uh, and with Shopee as well? Is you know, what are, can you give some examples without necessarily naming the company or whatever, where you've actually seen a change and, and things have improved and how have they improved? Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously, I can't give you specific names of organisations, but I can tell you the industries that I've been working with. Um, so I work a lot with multinational pharmaceuticals, biotech and financial services. They're the ones that are coming forward this year. OK, and it changes year on year. OK, due to things that are changing in their industry, um, things that are happening in the world. You know, there's lots of different factors that we need to take into account. But certainly this year, financial services, biotech and pharmaceuticals are like up there in terms of the companies that I'm working with. So these, I've noticed, are the industries that are most invested in creating psychologically safe workplaces right now. But as I said, it's going to change year on year. So like last year and the last few years, I've worked with insurance companies, solicitors, food manufacturers, just to name a few. Um, but just going back to a point that Shopee made earlier, in terms of what's working, what I've found is the five pillars that I created, they're the same, okay? And they're a methodology and a system that we take people through to increase psychological safety. Now, in terms of the, um, the scope and the delivery of the work that we do with those organizations, they might be different. OK, so for each organization, that intervention will be different. Um, but what I found is that the issues are generally the same. So when we're rolling out Lux, the diagnostic tool, Obviously, we're giving data to organizations, their specific data. So here's where you're at. Here's the things that are causing issues in with regards to the five pillars for you. We can really drill down into a lot of detail to, to figure out exactly what the issue is. But in the back end, I'm also um, collecting the data globally. So we're able to see data by location. So we know if there's any particular issues with particular pillars in particular areas. 
we're able to factor it down into industry and sector as well. And what I'm finding is that in sectors and industries and locations actually as well, a lot of the same issues are coming up that are different across other industries, sectors or locations. So it's fascinating when you look at the data and you bring it together as a bigger picture to see that, you know, quite a lot of the pharmaceuticals around the world, they're having the similar issues. And I think when I go into organizations and I talk to them about the issues that they're having and saying, look, look at this global data, you know, you're having similar issues. So what is the problem here? Is it within your organization or is it a much bigger picture here in terms of legislation or, you know, the process that you're taking people through? What is going on here for this to happen? Um, so that's kind of a byproduct, really, that... Um, that that's kind of come out because I, I created the diagnostic tool to give me data so I can lobby government to change uh, legislation. But getting that data is hugely important um, for that aspect, but it's also giving me the data that I need to take into organisations for a bigger picture for their industry and sector to say, look, this is what's going on across the board. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Uh, you know, and, and what are the issues? I mean, out of interest in the pharmaceutical industry, is there a particular thing that's you know that that's cropping up there that that's you know that 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 other companies watching this might might be interested in knowing about yeah absolutely so th there's kind of there's a, a few different areas that are kind of coming out across biotech and pharmaceuticals at the moment um the biggest area is about people not feeling safe to be their authentic self in the workplace so we're doing a lot of work around the first pillar okay which is focused around self bringing your whole self to work um, so that's kind of a, a really big area. The second biggest area is around communications. So there's this whole thing around people not feeling like they can communicate um, a message in the way that it was intended. So there's a lot of miscommunications, misunderstandings, conflict that's coming up as a result of that. So we're doing a lot of work around um, the communication cycle within the, the second pillar. And then the third biggest area really is around creating safe spaces. So imagine you're in a team, you're trying to create a safe space for meetings or collaboration, anything that you're doing as a team, people are really struggling to create that safe space and then to challenge people when it's not being created and not being, um, yeah, when people are not feeling safe, basically. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not figuring out how we can do that in a productive way. Um, so I would say they're the kind of three key areas, but we find that by taking people through the, the survey, the, the looks diagnostic, it's got 65 questions and each, each uh, this, it's in five sections. So each pillar has got specific questions to drill down into what is the specific area that you're struggling with in that particular pillar. So it's fascinating when the results come out to see it across the board that actually, you know, two or three areas in the first three pillars are coming out like pretty high for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Shopee, um, there's a phrase that 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 I, I, I think I saw on your on, on one of your LinkedIn posts, which was, you know, good is harder. And I guess that's one of the things about this, isn't it? It's, you know, trying to be good, trying to be a manager who thinks about all the ramifications of how you meet, whether can people can be themselves in the workplace. That actually takes quite a bit of work to be a kind of good, nice, you know, supportive manager um have you got any tips for you know the people that have tuned in today to join us to sort of understand what they should be thinking about and how they can be presenting themselves to their teams in the workplace that helps facilitate this psychological safety well one i always lead off with if there are managers in school who are already thinking about that that's a good thing because having a good level of self-awareness around this is really, really key. A lot of times people have to remind you, we don't have this. So if you're already thinking about it for your teams, you have to get off to a really good start. Um, and second thing that I would say is actually don't try and do this by yourself. Um, bring your team into the process. I will use a very, if I let me use my own personal example, I've been talking about a client. When I started looking after that team that I mentioned right at the start, and I went into there, I was like, this feels like an absolute car crash. I'm not sure how I'm going to navigate the team and everything they've kind of given to the responsibilities. And I literally just called a team meeting. I sat down with them. I was like, listen, here's what I want to do and build and create in this team. Here's the kind of environment I want, here's communication, respect, and different things that I think are really important to me. Now, I know and understand it's a very change in the way that things have been done in the past, 
but I want to look on this journey with you all. And I want you to have the freedom and the space to come to me and tell me if this is working, this is not working, blah, 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 blah. And I've actually shared a very vulnerable story with them as to why this is kind of important. After that, I met with them kind of one-on-one -on -one again, given that individual space rather than the team space for to talk and share with me. That change that I really wanted to see happen, it took a good six months. And in that six month period, the sales weren't going the way that we wanted to go either. So I wasn't having this pressure, like, oh my gosh, am I making the right decision? Man? So that was kind of really, really felt really, really hard. After about six months and that turnaround happened, within nine months, that particular team was delivering the most, and this was a global company making like 250 billion worldwide. They were the highest um, team making the highest sales within, within uh, the global company. And that, I say that to say that it took a good six to nine month period to get, and get them to that point and then they were just kind of flying. But what made them fly wasn't the fact that I came in and gave them the, the tools and they already had the experience, but there was a lot of stuff that they wanted to do that they felt that they couldn't. And my approach was to really get to know them, be open, be, be vulnerable, but we went on that journey together. So I would say, and to the point we're talking about, everyone's completely different in your teams, getting to know and understand your people individually will help you to know what they need what environment you need to create for them that will feel safe to them so they can bring enough of themselves to do the best work that they can possibly do because that's what you're trying to do and if you can do that everything else we talked about the innovation the growth joy and happiness at work will be will actually be there so that for me is actually the key of working with your team to get you to where you want to get to don't try and do it in isolation yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I don't know if there are any questions. I, I can't see any at the moment. So hopefully we've covered a lot of what people uh, wanted to hear on the call today. Um, but G Gina, perhaps we can sort of uh, end up sort of talking about, um, you know, what, what does what does success look like? Because as Shopee was saying there, you know, you might end up not performing for a little while through this um does performance dip sometimes and you've got to just be patient with it um you know not every busy business can operate like that i i don't know mm, mm. I, I think it depends where you're starting from really doesn't it in terms of how you define success so you might get one company who is doing pretty well anyway but they know that they've got a particular issue with i don't know communication or something so their definition of success will be very different to somebody else who is coming in right at the very beginning. Uh, let's say that you've got a merger on the table. So you've got a merger of a small team with a big organization. They're going to have a lot of issues going on in terms of how do I feel safe going into this new environment? You know, how do I navigate this transition that we're going to be uh, going through? Um, so I would say that the first key thing is get a, a baseline. So know where you're currently at. That's the most important thing. Define what success means to you. So, you know, look at your look at your data and think, this is where we are. What is it that we want to change here? What are the key things we want to see different going forward? And make it really clear what that looks like. So, so don't just say, I said earlier about having um, like broad topics that you want to cover. Don't just say we want to have better engagement. What does that look like? You know, what, how can you measure that? You know, um, if you say we want to make sure that people are being more innovative, how do you know they're being more innovative? So really define what you mean by success. And then once you've defined that, make sure that you share that with everybody. So it's all well and good, the senior leadership team having those measures and keeping them private. But if nobody else knows about them, how do they know that they're achieving, you know, the key things that you've set out to achieve? So transparency, openness, having conversations across the organization, not just in silos is hugely important when you're starting on this journey of measuring and creating psychologically safe workplaces. And Shopee, you'd echo that? 100% that. I wouldn't change anything on that. <laughs> <laughs> Our work here is done. <laughs> that is, that's a good all the boxes I was like, "Yep, yep, yep." yep. <laughs> I'm not in agreement. Like, <laughs> so um, for anybody uh, who would like to sort of find out more about the work you do, Shopee, um, how how can people um, get get in touch, uh, have a look at your website, listen to your podcasts, etc.? Yep, yeah, um, my website is www.mindsetshift.co.uk. Get a hold of me there. Um, it has all the links to who I want to talk about. You can contact me on LinkedIn as well. 
or send me an email at hello at mindsetshift.co.uk and the podcast that comes out every Tuesday and it's just talking to leaders all around the world in all walks of life really around their journey like the ups the downs different struggles they've had um the work both personal and professional and what's kind of helped them to get get them to where they get to right now so it's kind of delving a little bit deeper into a lot of people that we we see and we hear about but I want to hear the real talk so Everyday Leadership is available on all streaming platforms and YouTube as well. So you can check that out. Brilliant. Definitely give that a listen. Uh, and Gina, how, how can somebody uh, get in touch with you and, and find out more about these uh, the, these pillars that you've created? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the platform that I'm most active on is LinkedIn. If you just type in my name, I'm the only one that comes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes it so much easier, doesn't it? <laughs> Same if you Google me, I'm the only one. <laughs> for now, for now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, LinkedIn, I'm most active. If you want to read anything more about this, I write loads of stuff for the mainstream global press. I usually post it on LinkedIn. Feel free to send me a connection request. If you've got any questions, you can DM me on there. Um, if you want to talk about working together, then you can email me. It's my name, so Gina at ginabatty.com, super simple. And if you want to find out more about the five pillars and the work that I do and my approach, it's all on my website, and that's www.ginabatty.com. Brilliant. Nice and straightforward. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Thank you both for your time. And Sophie, uh, I think it was that put that lovely comment up, uh, who's really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so uh, just to let you know, that we'll be sharing the recording uh, with you all uh, so that you can watch it back on demand and share it with any colleagues that you want to share it with afterwards. And it'll also be placed on our YouTube channel as well. And also on our employee wellbeing platform, Ashia, where you can also find uh, lots of other broadcasts like this, uh, podcasts and expert content to help you manage your workplaces and provide early mental health and well-being support for your workforce and your employees. Do follow us uh, also on our social media or visit uh, our website to find out a little bit more. It just leaves me to thank you both Gina and Shopee for some fascinating insight and conversation today. It's been a really pleasure and I hope everybody who's tuned in today has found it insightful and helpful. Thank you so much everybody and enjoy the rest of your day.